I'm an ocean optimist, and I want to explore what that means. While asking myself what this optimism was all about, I wondered whether it was the British stiff upper lip, everything will be just fine, or growing up in a very positive family where there was always a solution to every problem, or whether, quite frankly, I'm just in denial. I know for one thing, I'm not naive. I've been really fortunate to travel the world, see a lot of the ocean firsthand, and I've seen desperate fishermen blasting the reefs to catch the last few fish, devastating a beautiful, diverse landscape in a matter of seconds. I've seen beaches clogged with plastic, harbors full of litter. I've seen the desperate look in a fish's eyes as they come back at the end of the day with a tiny catch which is nowhere enough to feed their family the next day. And I've seen the more insidious impacts of climate change. Even in the most remote, best protected parts of the ocean, coral reefs bleaching white, dead and dying because of increasing sea surface temperatures. And it's not just these far off, glamorous, tropical places. It's right here at home. It's impossible to go to a beach in Cornwall or anywhere in the UK, or in fact, most places in the world, without seeing rubbish and plastic along the shore. My children are growing up learning how to do beach cleans rather than just enjoying a healthy, natural environment. And it's not just these images I take with me and I carry around the world with me. I also know from the data there's papers, graphs, charts, and information that show that the ocean is in really deep trouble. So why, considering all of this and all that I know and have seen, why am I still an ocean optimist? I've put it down to three reasons. The first of these is the power of the individual. Anywhere you go, people from all walks of life who are making a difference. Against all odds, they are making things happen. And when I got involved 20 years ago in marine conservation, I was fortunate to work with one of these individuals who led and, and continues to champion the cause for the tiny seahorse. The quirkiest, most extraordinary of fishes. It doesn't really look like a fish, and it's not really very good at fishy-like things like swimming. Um, but these extraordinary fish have some incredible characteristics. They mate for life, and the male becomes pregnant, brooding the young in his pouch and giving birth to beautiful, perfectly formed tiny seahorses, which is a, as a woman and a mother of two children certainly is an attractive characteristic. <laughs> but the problem is these traits have meant that seahorses have become a globally traded commodity, with tens of millions of seahorses, over 70 countries involved in a trade for traditional Chinese medicines, for curiosities, souvenirs, and for the hobby trade as live animals. They also live in shallow seas around the world, some of the most coast, uh, vulnerable coastal habitats that there are. The future looked bleak for the seahorse, until this one individual, then three of us, and then a small team came together and actually decided to do something about it. And together, we've helped establish global trade legislation that makes the trade more sustainable for seahorses. We've de developed technology that helps people around the world monitor seahorse populations. And we've worked in seahorse hotspots with communities to set up seahorse sanctuaries that protects not just seahorses, but all the other marine life with them. Within these communities, there, were, there are equally powerful individuals committed to make a change for their marine life and to build and restore their livelihoods. In 20 years, we've set up over 40 marine protected areas, these sanctuaries where not just seahorses, but corals, mangroves, seagrasses, and the incredible biodiversity that we see in the region and in the oceans are starting to recover and really come back. So never underestimate the individual. Reason number two I'm an ocean optimist is the power of collaboration. 
Conservation is inherently really tricky. You're either trying to stop destructive practices, you're trying to change behaviours or attitudes, you're trying to find that tricky balance between the use and abuse of natural resources. Conservation is flourishing in some ways. There wasn't even a degree on the topic when I was at university, and now, now there are many. But it's still a tiny business, comparatively, and desperately under-resourced. So all too often, conservation organisations are pitched against each other instead of with each other to compete for the tiny resources and profile for their particular issue. Collaboration is much easier to say and much harder to actually do. Yet I've been really fortunate to be involved in several collaborations that have shown that it's time to put aside egos and logos and get on with the job in hand, which is saving the ocean and indeed the planet. I wanted to talk about one of these collaborations, which is where six conservation organisations have come together to protect the oceans further with a focus on the UK overseas territories. Now, our overseas territories contain 94% of all the UK's biodiversity. It makes the UK responsible for more penguins than any other nation. And we rank number seven in coral reef nations. They're quite extraordinary. We have the largest coral, uh, living coral atoll in the world. And I've been fortunate to visit two of these, the Chagos Archipelago right in the middle of the Indian Ocean and the Pitcairn Islands in the remote South Pacific. These places are not only isolated and, dis and, and poorly known, but they're like living in a wildlife documentary. Landing on a deserted island, the cacophony of noise of the seabirds as they s fly all around you. Diving amongst the incredible diversity and abund sheer abundance of fish. And seeing what life looks like on a pristine coral reef. The Chagos Archipelago, 500 kilometres south of the Maldives, is one of the largest protected areas in the world, 640,000 square kilometres of ocean. It has the greatest fish biomass of anywhere in the Indian Ocean and the cleanest seawater ever recorded on Earth. This surely is worth protecting. And working with this collaboration, we've been looking to achieve the same level of protection for the Pitcairn Islands, in the South Pacific and the Ascension Islands in the Atlantic. Collaboration translates to a lot of hours, a lot of hard work, respecting each other's differences, diversity and complementary skills. There's some arguments, a lot of banter, but a common goal and mission that has united us to achieve great things and work together collaboratively. The second collaboration I wanted to talk about is slightly more unusual, and that's about carpets. Yes, carpets. We've worked with the world's leading carpet tile manufacturer, who have an incredibly ambitious sustainability agenda, but also a desire to see how a carpet tile could address social inequality, which has combined with our ambition to help coastal communities in developing countries who have very few options and live well below the poverty line. The solution was to focus on a huge problem of ocean waste around discarded fishing nets. We've worked with these communities to collect nets off the beaches and out of the ocean, to recycle those nets into nylon, a nylon yarn that is then used to make carpet tiles. By setting up this supply chain, we've been able to develop a business model that actually pays the communities for collecting these nets. And to achieve that in a sustainable way, we've set up community banks where they can save and access financial services previously completely impossible for such isolated coastal communities. In just three years of piloting this project, we've helped 50,000 people. We've collected over 100 tonnes of discarded fishing nets. If you can't visualise that in weight, that's around the world twice as a functional fishing net. And that's just the beginning. Our ambition is to scale up and to diversify. We're already expanding from our work in the Philippines to Cameroon, and we want to collect 1,000 tonnes of nets a year, help a million people, and protect a billion square metres of ocean. 
The third reason I'm an ocean optimist is because the ocean, quite simply, is amazing. Just take a second and pull up an amazing ocean memory, whether it's fishing with your granddad, watching a sunset with a loved one, dabbling in a rock pool. The ocean is truly extraordinary. And if we can have a common goal where we see that ocean as healthy, our beaches clean, fish abundant and prov providing for everybody, whales, dolphins, seahorses, thriving, then we can work together to achieve that goal. But we often feel that the problems are too big for us, that it's somebody else's problem, that somebody else must have the answer and be able to solve it, that our individual actions cannot have an impact. But I want to take one example to change that thinking, and that's around the single-use plastic water bottle. This is me in the Chagos Archipelago, an uninhabited island, over 300 plastic bottles after just 20 minutes on a deserted, uninhabited island. There is no away. Plastic bottles, all of us use about 200 a year, every single one of us in this room. About one third of those are recycled, and those plastic bottles last 1,000 years. And in the UK, they're the most common item of marine litter on our beaches. About 8 million tonnes of plastic is entering our ocean every single year. And current trajectory, there's going to be more plastic than fish by the year 2050. So what can we do about it? Well, it is a problem we can solve, and we're starting to do that. In 2015, we worked with the luxury department store, Selfridges, who now no longer sell plastic bottles to their customers, taking away that choice. We've worked with individuals, with groups, with my own organisation, London Zoo, Whipsnade Zoo, we no longer sell plastic bottles. People can make that individual choice to use a refillable bottle instead. This just goes to show that there is no formula to being a conservationist. You don't have to be a marine biologist or a scientist like myself. It just depends what you want to do. Everybody can help the ocean. Everybody can be a conservationist. So I'd like to end this by taking my three examples of why I'm an ocean optimist and asking you to take three actions away from today. Number one, switch to a refillable bottle. We even gave you one, so you have no excuse. Number two, in Cornwall we're all close to the beach and the UK is an island nation. Next time you're next to the a canal, the river or on the beach, take a few minutes to clean it up. Make our ocean a healthier, more beautiful place. And finally, like me, be an ocean optimist, an individual out there to make a difference, seeking collaboration and working with others and looking for a brighter future for our amazing ocean. Thank you.